Breaking It Down with Frank McKay. This is 1039 LI News Radio. I'd like to welcome everyone to Breaking It Down. Our very special guest for this segment is Gary Wells. Gary sometimes gets overshadowed by Evil Knievel, uh, you know, because of the flamboyance, but boy, his. His career is uh, just as legendary, and and certainly, uh, it, it, what what a career, what a career. Gary Wells, how are you? Good, Frank. Frank, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, how accurate is that introduction? I mean, uh, <laughs> you, you know, er, when you think of stunt drivers and stunt uh, stunt men, um, the first guy that usually comes up is Evil Knievel. He got all the hype. Is well, that right? No, it is and it isn't. Uh, there's just not much of a comparison because I'm not a stuntman or a daredevil. I'm yep. a world champion professional motorcycle rider that has raced from the beginning of my life, essentially, in uh, go-karting, going into motorcycling at age 10, and I'm 57, still riding a motorcycle, still holding a world title for the longest motorcycle jump in the world. I've defended my title in numerous different countries, and uh, now we're writing a book on my life story, a biography uh, that I think is going to explain everything to people thoroughly. H- how was your body, right? I mean, you're 57 <laughs> years old, you're still riding. I imagine you broke a couple bones along the way. Oh, I, I've only had a couple accidents. The, the main thing was Caesar's Palace. Uh, I missed the landing ramp on the landing side and <clears throat> immediately ran into a brick wall head on at 85 miles an hour. So that that was pretty uh catastrophic. I almost died in front of the uh entire country right on national television, but uh I survived. I had a torn aorta, multiple compound fractures in my legs, my feet turned backwards, broken back, pelvis. But uh, you know, 5 months later continued to tour around the country and ended up jumping all the Formula One cars in Rio de Janeiro for the 81 Brazilian Grand Prix. Uh, it's Honestly, it's it's been an amazing career. Just looking at some of your jumps uh, makes me uh, cringe. Uh, you do it effortlessly, and I, you know, I haven't seen you recently, but I mean, uh, some of the jumps that you made, uh, and especially the one you just mentioned, I think everyone has seen that, uh, you know, played over. Do you, do you watch the crashes? Or do you only watch the successful jumps? For myself? Well, yeah, for yourself. I basically only had the one crash. Um, you haven't had other crashes other than that? Nothing uh, of anything that mattered. It literally just uh, a little mistake uh, in a practice session, slid down and picked it back up and continued on. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not really what my events were about. They were all about success. That's the big difference between other motorcycle jumpers and myself. You know, it's not about the failure. Anybody can be a failure. I'm sure we can put you on a motorcycle and, and I can you crash. would be a great failure. But that's not the point. You know, being a world champion motorcycle rider, that's the key. And that's something that I've been able to pull off in virtually all different aspects of motorcycle riding. I've done it on a world-class level. I still do. If you look at my website, GaryWells.com, you'll get a lot of information, and that's why we're doing the book. There's quite a few things in in my life that are a mystery. A lot of it was probably intentional. Uh, The events were the important thing, trying to promote to the youth of America to stay off drugs, drink when you're old enough, but uh, in moderation, and try to have a good time and enjoy yourself, and that's what I'm still able to do, still riding motorcycles, and... uh, Hopefully, we'll be the oldest ever to uh, be jumping and still be a world champion. For those who are just tuning in, you're listening to the voice of Gary Wells, who's really one of the godfathers of extreme sports. I don't know if you like that <laughs> that uh, that comparison, but you you clearly are. Uh, you're one of the uh, pioneers, and that makes you sound very old. And at 57, you're really not that old. Uh, <laughs> you, you're you're really one of the pioneers when it when it comes to what you know, what, what these guys are doing. And quite frankly, the, the X games and, and the extreme sports, uh, these guys are making some bucks now. I mean, I, back then you probably had to be more creative in order to make it. Uh, how would you like to have been born a few years later? 
Well, I, I don't think it would have really worked. You know, the, the problem with with all of those things not not to be negative, but just the the reality is too many people are being hurt. You know, they're they're not supervised very well. There's when I say hurt, I mean literally killed. There's uh, been many doing the freestyle, and it's just uh, it's done for the wrong reason. In my eyes, my whole goal was to be the best in the world riding a motorcycle. Whether I was running motocross, I rode the original motocross ever in in the U.S. That's, that's how old I really am, and I started at such a young age, and then going through all the dirt track racing and off road desert racing. Uh, you know, I won the Pikes Peak Hill Climb in '95, which is the second oldest race in the world. The Unser brothers were doing that back in the beginning of time for for motorcycle racing and car racing, and uh, you know it's just. There's different ways to look at things, and the way I ride a motorcycle is very different from anybody else. I didn't dabble in other fields. I stuck to riding a motorcycle, and I mean 12 hours a day. You mentioned being 10 years old and riding go-karts, and maybe you said it and I just missed it, but when was the first time you climbed on a motorcycle? I was 10 on the motorcycles. I actually started in the go-karts at three and a half years old, probably one if not the youngest in the world ever. Uh, Go kart racing at three and a half up through the age of ten, and literally had to make a change. Which all these things are going to be in the book, but I've I've always had a, a problem with timing. My timing has always been bad. Like you um, mentioned earlier, you know, if I could could change when I was doing my events, I, I think it all worked out fine, and I'm still doing them. But I've always had people telling me I was too young, too young, too young, and then the next thing I knew, then they changed it to you're too old you're too old. So it's like, well, wait a minute, where did this right timing come in? Well, I think it's all been right because it's been doing things my way and, and at my own schedule. And I've had to make a lot of changes. I was literally ran out of go-karting because I was too young by the sanctioning body. They brought in new rules. And, you know, these things are all in the book, which I think people are going to find rather interesting. It's not a book on um, motorcycle jumping per se. It's a book that uh, covers my life, what uh, made me who I am today, from my parents to uh, to just all the different positions I've been put into over money. You know, when you talked about making big money, you have to realize when I defended the world title against Australia in the World Long Distance Motorcycle Jumping Competition in 1980, I literally had the highest television audience ever for CBS Sports Television. What was the number on that? Do you remember? No, I don't. I sure don't. But back then, that. that's, I'm telling you, just with what information you gave us, that's that's a huge number because uh, back then there were, there were three networks. That was before Fox, I'm sure, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I did a lot of things with CBS. Ken Squires and I got to be real good friends, and I did many, many events defending my title against uh, France, uh, England, Australia, Czechoslovakia, Canada. You know, I won all these titles and continued to defend the country, you know, the USA, for the world championship title. And, uh, you know, it's something that other people weren't able to do, and I I enjoyed doing it. But uh, at the same hand, I, I was always pushing myself to go further and continue on. But, uh, you know, the money was always part of it. I enjoyed making the, the bigger dollars and uh, still dabbled in the racing back and forth. I was able to, to do a little bit of everything. So it was it was an interesting time. Now, back then, you know, a million dollars was a million dollars. Do you remember your first big check? And you don't have to be specific if, specific if you don't want to be, but what was your first big check that well, you made from racing? Well, I, well from, from jumping or racing? Either or. Well, the, the, the racing, I had a problem. I was literally run out of motorcycle racing because I was too young. You had to be 18 to run professional races, but the professionals could run amateur or sportsman races, we called them. So I was beating the world champions, but I couldn't go run the events and get a factory sponsorship where there were some dollars involved. So at that point, I said, well, you know what? That's fine. I'm 14 years old. I've already done it by the time I was 13 as far as the racing against these world champions. And I'll just go ahead and go to the next step. I'll start jumping over cars. I had heard that the dollars were pretty good. I was the second motorcycle jumper to come in after 
uh, Knievel being the first because he was almost my father's age. I was just 14 years old, mm. and there was big money. In three months, in 1972, I made over $100,000 in three months. So the dollars were there, and it progressed on from there. And, uh, you know, it was just... Uh, a different type of lifestyle. I was able to buy the equipment and do things the way I wanted. That's a problem with a lot of people. They they have a hard time getting the equipment to do things, so then they end up having crashes and, and failures that should have never happened. So many guys, and, you know, Knievel was one of them, who made money, and, well, I mean, you're talking about at a very, very young age uh, making money, but they blow it. And I don't care if they're a rap star or rock rock star athletes, they have the habit of blowing it. How were you with your, your money? Were you did you handle it well? Well, at that point, you know, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, I, I was with my parents. We toured together around the country doing state fairs, and and money was good. I mean, literally in seventy two, seventy three, I was making the same money that the Osmonds and the Jackson Five were making. Mm. I was at, at at the premium doing state fairs and, and different events like this around the country. So my parents basically dealt with the, the dollar issue. If I wanted something or needed equipment, you know, I went ahead and, and got what I needed for events and to be happy and, and continue riding every day. I rode 12 hours a day on a motorcycle. But, uh, no, the biggest problems came in later when I branched out on my own away from my parents which it was time, but uh, I made some bad choices. I uh, hooked up with a partner who uh, literally embezzled uh, half a million dollars from me in less than two years. So mm. those type of things were issues. But, you know, I'm not the only guy. I remember hearing a story about uh, Billy Joel, how uh, a relative of his, through his marriage, I think it was, yeah. did the same to him, but he probably lost a million or more. So, you know, it's out there for everybody in every different direction. I I never really worried about the money that much. I just I used it. To me, money has always been a means to an end, and the end for me is to buy the motorcycles or the cars that I've had and the the van to tour in a big box van customized, and you know to be able to you know not go crazy but uh, to live comfortably and mainly to to facilitate my equipment. Without my equipment, I'm I'm virtually nothing. You have to have good equipment no matter who you are. For those who are just tuning in, Gary Wells is a, a champion, many, many years, a, a champion motorcycle uh, driver, a rider. What is it? Rider, driver. What's the proper terminology? Motorcycle rider. Rider, okay. So mo motorcycle rider. And uh, you you don't like the term stuntman, but uh, but you certainly have done some jumps that that rival anything that that evil can evil did actually uh, surpassed what evil can evil did you hold the record i believe right you, if, oh def definitely i set the world record when i was 14 years old right here in phoenix phoenix is like my second home i was raised in las vegas and moved out to arizona and phoenix in 1969 for a racing sponsorship through a local uh, yamaha Boltaco dealer and things were great continued racing california nevada arizona a lot of traveling, even at, at such a young age. My dad wanted me to um, always run against the, the better competition in the country, and the West Coast has always had, in those days, it's changed considerably because the whole country's changed. But back then, you know, California was always number one in the motorcycle racing as well as the go-karting. And, you know, in doing that, I, I learned a lot. I was constantly pushing myself as well as my dad finding new ways to uh, to push my talents and continue on. But the, the motorcycle jumping with, with my type of events, the, there wasn't the, the hoopla and the, the, the crazy, stupid things that uh, other people had done because there was no reason for it. I was a world champion motorcycle rider. I set goals and I, I created events, and we tagged on a phrase that stuck with me very well called the unique and the unimaginable. And that's what I performed in front of people. You know, when I lined up 30 cars, which was over half the length of a football field from takeoff to touchdown, I was flying those distances virtually uh, flawlessly and w with a tremendous amount of ease. And the only way I could do that was the amount of practice and preparation and training that I put myself through at 12 hours a day to be prepared. 
not going out and partying and just, you know, wasting time and then thinking I could show up and get on a motorcycle, which has been done by, oh, different people, I'm sure, you know, where they're uh, they're not quite with it. Too much drinking, too much partying, and uh, a lot of failures. And failures, not, it's just not what I'm about. Failure does not agree with me. Well, it sounds like it sounds like a self help book as much as anything else, too. <laughs> uh, biography, but it also uh, like a how to. Uh, would you call it that? Uh, are you pushing it as a self help book? Well, not really. I think you know everybody has to to make their own choices, their own decisions, and go their own directions. And and definitely, I would never want anybody to emulate the things that I have done or the things that I will be doing in the future. That's something that I've been very against my my entire career, because that, that's not what I'm promoting. I'm promoting that I'm the guy that, that has the ability to do it, and I would love to entertain people that enjoy watching the spectacular things that can be done on a motorcycle, from riding on the rear wheel at any speed imaginable, from 5 miles an hour to a 135, 140 miles an hour, waving one-handed on the rear wheel, and riding the motorcycle backwards, literally spinning around, sitting on it backwards and riding. And I've even uh, was noted for doing backwards wheelies. I started that back in Australia in 1980 when I went for the world title just to uh, amaze the newspaper guy who kept telling me, well, I I don't think you can get on the front cover. Well, I'm in a third world country. I'm in Australia. I've already been the king of the, the number one country in the world, the U.S., and I'm in Australia with a newspaper guy kind of telling me, well, I don't think that's worth being on the front cover. And this was prior to the actual jump-off competition. So I just kept kept picking his brain. Well, what if I do this? What if I do this? You get a picture of this. So finally, I just kind of go off the wall. I go, hey, how about if I not only ride the bike backwards, but I do a backwards wheelie for you? That got his attention. So, okay, let's go for it. <laughs> so I put the bike out on the uh, the racetrack that I was going to perform on, kind of a drag strip road course combination, all paved, and I had a nice center line to guide myself, seeing how I'm looking the opposite direction. And I popped it straight up and down and balanced myself and wheelied down the drag strip. So I got the front page of the newspaper in Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, nice way to go. Let's talk about your book for a little bit. And if you're just tuning in, Gary Wells is our very special guest, and he is a champion motorcycle rider, and he has a very, very interesting uh, story. He is, uh, he's been a champion for many years, 57 years old now, uh, Gary. What, what's the book about, and, and when did you come about uh, the idea of, buy, uh, of, of writing the book, and who published it, and how do people get it? Let's get into it a little. Okay. Uh, the, the book's going to uh, be titled disclosure and it's basically um all the things that that made me who i am today which was obvious my my mother and my father we were pretty close-knit together all the time traveling with all the different racing and and it kind of brought me into this to the uh person that i am and and helped me with a lot of choices in my life um you know, there were some interesting things that you know, all everything's going to be in the book. I, I don't want to release too much of it, but at the same hand, you know, people need to understand, like I mentioned earlier, it's not about the motorcycle jumping. Uh, you know, my father had been an alcoholic and um, had a lot of problems in his younger years and at one point just kind of realized that uh, the most important thing for him was going to be this was after a lengthy stay in a, in a prison in uh, Nevada, he uh, got out with AA's help and became a a, uh, recovering alcoholic and put most of his energy in his entire life from that point on into my career, and my mom was always part of it. She was always there, and we traveled together, and our life was all about racing, and, you know, just uh, between myself and him, you know, we wanted to win. We we weren't happy losing. We weren't uh, poor losers by any means. But at the same hand, uh, losing, you need to pull yourself up and look at why you lost an event or a race and make some changes. And that meant I needed to practice a different way, practice harder, longer, 
and really put it together. I'd um, had those abilities in the go-karting and won multiple state championships against a lot older people. I was not racing against kids. I was racing against 18- to 30-year-old men. And at 10 years old, went into motorcycling, and there were just a couple guys that were already two and three, four years older than I was in the motorcycle racing and kind of uh, went the same direction. I had to, to really pick myself up to go against these older men. The motorcycles were very large and heavy, and I was a 80-pound, uh, 10-year-old kid. But a lot of weight training and uh, you know just having the balance to be able to ride the bikes. But the book goes, uh, you know, very in-depth and in, in a lot of different things from uh, my family and even into the problems that I had with, uh, you know, a partner who took me for a lot of money and didn't really care about it. I almost died at Caesar's Palace. That was uh, not a good situation. And, uh, you know, various different things about uh, the type of uh, events I've done and the reason that I've chose this for a, a lifestyle. Gary Wells is our very special guest. We have about a minute left. Uh, GaryWells.com, right? That's W-E-L-L-S at right. the end. And yep. there people can follow uh, it really what's an amazing career, and it's still going on, and he's still racing. Uh, we have about 30 seconds left. When's the next time you're racing? Well, I'm not really sure at this point. I've been uh, in Mexico quite a bit. I have a RV park in Mexico, and Quite a few things going on down there. I love the beaches. I live on the beach down there. There's tremendous motorcycle riding, no fences, and just a lot of freedom. So I, I go back and forth from Phoenix to Mexico. But a lot of events down there, the spring breaks, I did numerous shows in Mexico with sand drags and different events that the country has, similar to the U.S. But hopefully I will be uh, performing a world tour here uh, in the next Two years or so, when I'm 60 years old, I hope to do a world tour promoting the book. We're dealing with a documentary and maybe a movie on my life at the same time. So things are things are starting to pick up and really going in the right direction. I think people will be interested in seeing. GaryWells.com is the website. Go there. Gary Wells is a wonderful, wonderful guest and, and certainly champion motorcycle rider. You cannot uh, succeed anymore in that business than this man has. Please go to his site. Gary, thanks for being here. Oh, thank you very much, Frank. I really enjoyed it.